Stories of comings and goings hang in the mist like ghosts. Coyote and Meadowlark took a rope and stretched it across the river, and they walked down the river trying to figure out when they wanted to drop the rope and create the Willamette Falls. Stare for a while, and you sense an atmosphere of promise, of potential. It was a focal point. It was a gathering spot. It was a place of power. And each culture that has come through got to the falls and stopped and thought about how they could best utilize what nature had created. A fluke of geology, Willamette Falls elbows 1,500 feet across the river that shares its name and rises four stories high. I really believe this is one of the great geological secrets uh, of North America. It is the second largest waterfall in the United States, volume-wise. The only one being bigger is Niagara Falls. People don't even realize that. Human history has concentrated around this natural feature in unusual abundance. Indian people have been at the Willamette Falls since time immemorial. Since thought of human people became conscious, we've been there. Political and economic power and people's livelihoods have ebbed and flowed at the falls. This hasn't moved since 1990 and is still sharp enough to cut trees. God, there was how many million board feet of timber went down this river. A state was born here, Oregon. This was the end of the Oregon Trail. This is where people stopped and settled. And this is where moving water revolutionized how people live forever. There's so many firsts here that have implications not only nationally but globally that changed our way of life. And it all started right in this little mess of buildings that most people just drive by on 205. Industry rose up around the falls. To the east, in Oregon City, a paper mill. To the west, another paper mill. And one of the oldest power plants in the country. Alongside a historic canal and lock system. Altogether, perhaps 100 acres. A small, vibrant laboratory. This was like NASA. This was like the Silicon Valley. And it really changed the world. There's a lot of cascading water that's trying to knock you out of where you're trying to be. It's pretty wild. It's a dangerous encounter. A strong sense of self-preservation is always there because you don't want to get swept underneath the rocks. That's a bad deal. So you're reaching into crevices and, and different openings and just feeling for tails or, or the fish's body. If there were a mascot for Willamette Falls, perhaps the lamprey would do. Every summer, these ancient jawless fish return from the Pacific Ocean to climb and swim their way back to fresh waters where they lay their eggs. Any lamprey that wants to spawn in the Willamette has got to get over these falls. Biologists have installed a system of ramps to ease the journey, but dwindling numbers across the Northwest have them concerned. Lamprey are still very much a mystery. Some of the basic information that we understand about salmon, we're still years away from understanding with lamprey. We've been working on a lot of those questions at Willamette Falls. This is the last remaining place in the 260,000 square mile Columbia River Basin where tribes can harvest lamprey for traditional subsistence. To come back to places like this, where you know that people have been coming back generation after generation after generation, it's kind of like knowing that you're home, but in a much deeper sense, like the place where you've always been. It's deeply personal. Lasting just days, the harvest is a sustaining ritual that reaches deep into history. Every time you're out here, it's, it's a little bit different, and, and the flows and everything can make it a fairly dramatic and, and frightening place to be. You, you feel like you've moved back in time. It wasn't lamprey that first drew European traders to the area. 
it was a demand for beaver to feed the fashion of the day. In the 1820s, while managing trade in the region for the Hudson's Bay Company, Jean McLaughlin, the man who would come to be known as the father of Oregon, seized an opportunity. He understood the falls formed a natural dam and a reservoir with untapped energy that could turn a wheel and generate horsepower. He got to the falls and immediately sets about industrializing it. He digs a mill race through the bedrock and puts up a sawmill, probably the first sawmill west of the Mississippi. And that enabled him to mill timber, to build buildings, and start a community that becomes Oregon City. By harnessing the force of cascading water, McLaughlin sets in motion a chain reaction of development. In 1841, the first wagon train of the Oregon Trail arrives. Think about a, a, a family setting out across the country into the unknown, and they finally got to Oregon, and they got to the falls, and they went, okay, we're done. Oregon City was founded because it was the end of the trail. There was an obstacle to going any further, Willamette Falls. Obstacle and opportunity. With a humble start, McLaughlin establishes Oregon City as the seat of government for the Oregon Territory, the first incorporated town west of the Missouri. It soon hosts a literary society, an opera, and the first newspaper this side of the Rockies. The Oregon Spectator advertises that a wagon and four horses could cross the river to fast-growing Lynn City for 75 cents. The falls was the center of a bustling place, but so it had been for a great many years. I think people don't realize that the Oregon Trail ended there at Oregon City in the Willamette Falls, but there was 14,000 years of history of people living in that place and making a home there before that trail ever existed. You cannot um, be a person without all those generations before you building up to who you are. We're not isolated individuals. We're a culmination of history. Tribes from the Grand Ronde, Salettes, and Warm Springs, and from the Yakima Nation, cherish their historic ties to the falls. That was one of the major trading hubs. So it became a real important place, not just for the folks who lived there, but for everyone else in the region who came there to trade. It was a crossroads with a well-stocked pantry. The salmon. <laughs> the salmon was the main reason, you know. It was a place where you didn't have to go looking for your food, it came to you. You just had to be ready when it got there. So it makes a good place to live. Since the falls was mostly impassable to fish, the waters below held a bounty for fishermen, all because of geologic chance. Beginning 17 million years ago, magma spilling from the northeastern corner of Oregon poured 400 miles across the state and hardened into these basalt walls. The basalt here was formed by one of the greatest volcanic eruptions on the face of the earth. Then starting some 18,000 years ago, the Missoula floods, among the largest ever, scoured the 40-foot plunge energy people would seek to claim like miners after gold. And harnessing that power really set Oregon on a totally different course. We stopped being a pioneer state. We moved to become a more industrial area. Mills pitched up on both sides of the falls, and industries flourished over the decades. Wool and grain, timber and paper. But their success depended on resolving a paradox Manufacturers needed moving water, but the falls was a barrier for transporting goods and people. Travel up or down river meant going around at great expense. That changed on New Year's Day, 1873. This is the first locks and canal built west of the Mississippi. The opening of these locks broke the monopoly that controlled shipping on the Willamette and impeded the growth of agriculture all through the Willamette Valley. It was a nine-month project funded by the state and local investors. After a laborious excavation, workers hand-chiseled stone blocks to create a four-chambered canal, 40 feet wide and almost three-quarters of a mile long. 
there would be pleasure craft, travel craft, stern wheelers that were sort of the 747s of the era. This was a freeway. When the locks breached the falls, political power flowed to Portland. But another form of power was about to be perfected here. For most Americans living in the 1880s, it was still heated with wood, you cooked with wood, you illuminated your house with kerosene or with whale oil, and electricity really didn't exist. Towns were small. In 1889, three quarters of the U.S. was rural. Portland was a village of 44,000. For most people, electricity was an impractical wonder. Electricity was really something of a parlor trick. It was a novelty. You had to live near where it was generated to take advantage of it because it couldn't be transmitted very far. But that was about to change. Against the east face of Willamette Falls, on this outcrop, Portland entrepreneurs erected a modest looking facility and strung it with wire heading 14 miles downstream. They brought in technologies that were untried and they set them out there in the water and kept their fingers crossed. On the 3rd of June, 1889, water spun dynamos at the falls and Portland would become a city of lights. These crumbling remains are the birthplace of the technology that created the 20th century. A group of intrepid Oregonians had the crazy notion that they could take the power that was generated by the Willamette Falls and transmit it all the way to downtown Portland, the first long distance transmission of electricity in the history of the world. It was a sweeping technological revolution. The possibilities seemed without limit. Once the Willamette Falls were harnessed and we could produce electricity, we had to figure out what to do with all of this power. But you can't store electricity. And so all of these new technologies spring up to take advantage of this source. And the big one in Portland was trolleys, electric trolleys. Just two years later, Portland had 40 miles of streetcar tracks. Over the next three decades, those numbers would double three more times. Meanwhile, another industry was leaping forward at the falls. When it comes to pulp and paper manufacture, the falls are perfect. You've got all of this power, you've got all of this water, and you're in Oregon, where there are trees just down the road in every direction. Farmers in the Willamette Valley were eager to be rid of old growth timber, carpeting some of the nation's richest soils. Conveniently, a mill arises just west of the falls, and its owners bring a modern ambition to use wood for making paper, rather than rags and straw. My family has been in this paper mill for 116 years, and counting. My grandfather started in this mill in 1896. He was a, a paper maker. My dad started in 1932, and I started in 1974. I worked all the way from the bottom job up to the lead man, the foreman's job. Um, ran every job. I'm a fixer. I, I repair things. Sludge up okay, Chris? For decades, Ray's work looked much like what his father and grandfather knew. Our log grass came to us two city blocks long, all day long. We had... <clears throat> We had trees that were 400 years old. A single raft could move the load of 100 log trucks. We would take a whole log, and we'd cut her down to small blocks of wood, and then it went to the grind room, and they ground it into pulp. It was a very demanding job, <laughs> very demanding. The woods of Western Oregon met their demise at this mill, in this room. In exchange for trees, mills made jobs and produced enormous quantities of newsprint for presses up and down the West Coast and beyond. And newspapers in that era was what bound us together as a community. It was how you knew what the president was doing and what the politics were of the day and what was on sale at the Piggly Wiggly.
The old saws at Westland Paper Company are silent now. I was here the last day that this ran. And it got very quiet. No more saws. No more noise. Dead quiet. Yep, I could hear the falls. Yet just steps from here, the modern area of the plant operates 24-7, turning pulp from Canada into high-quality glossy paper for magazines and other publications. It's one of the most resource and energy efficient mills in the region. A second large paper company across the Willamette, Blue Heron, is closed. And the original power plant at the falls is an archaeological landmark. But the complex that replaced it in 1895 on the west side of the river continues to generate electricity. It too made history. The company that would become Portland General Electric asked George Westinghouse to construct generators larger than any he'd built before. Westinghouse was doubtful, but he was a businessman. He said, gee, I don't know if that's going to work. I'll make them for you, but I won't guarantee that they'll function. They worked splendidly. Westinghouse became a brand name for a prosperous new industry. And the utility had the largest generating facility in the state. Today, the T.W. Sullivan plant is among the oldest continuously operated hydro plants in America. T.W. Sullivan was a hydro engineer of incredible caliber and vision. With intuition, creativity, and a slide rule, he was the man who powered Portland for half a century. Sullivan's presence may still be felt in these passageways. I've never believed much in the supernatural, but when I was working down there by myself, I had that strange feeling that I wasn't alone. Jack Phillips,